Many students often find cross products intimidating. Probably because of that scene from Lord of the Rings when the great physicist Gandalf presents them in a not so positive manner. My physics class, because of the unit on cross products and their use in calculating torques. But cross products are actually extremely intuitive and extremely useful. And in this video, we'll talk about what exactly a cross product is and why on earth you'd need one. So it often happens that we need to multiply two vectors to get a third product vector that is perpendicular to the first two. The only way to do this is to go into a three dimensional space and add an extra third dimension. Because if you have two vectors sitting in one plane, the only way to get a third vector perpendicular to the first two is to add an extra dimension for that third vector to sit in. Draw this one out. Trust me, it will make it much, much simpler. And that's all that a cross product is. You're basically multiplying two vectors to get a third one that's perpendicular to the first two. And a quick aside, since we're working in three-dimensional space, we need a good way to represent vectors that aren't in the plane of the page. So, you know, maybe we can represent vectors that are, you know, directly in the wall, you know, in the plane of the wall, but we need a way to represent vectors that are coming out of the wall or going into the wall. And in your case, this will probably be coming out of the page or going into the page. So how do we do that? Well, the convention that we use in physics and probably like the entire world is that a dot, a dot on a page is a vector coming out towards you where a cross is a vector going into you. So a dot is a vector coming out of the page and a cross is a vector coming, uh, going directly back into the page. You're probably wondering where the, on earth this dot cross stuff comes from. Well, the way it comes from is about thinking of a vector like an arrow. If you have a vector going out of the page, coming towards you, what you will see is a dot that is the tip of the arrow. Conversely, if you have a vector going into the page, going away from you, what you will see is this sort of cross. And so that's where the convention comes from. Out of the page is a dot, into the page is a cross. So mathematically, we can represent the cross product with this formula, that the magnitude of the cross product of two vectors, a and b, the magnitude of a cross b, is equal to the magnitude of a times the magnitude of b times the sine of theta, the angle in between the two vectors. And this actually sort of comes from the area of a parallelogram, and we'll go into that into another video. Now, if you know your vectors pretty well, um, you might not be pr pretty satisfied with this formula because you might say that the, vec that the cross product is returning another vector, and this formula is giving me only the magnitude of that vector, but vectors have both magnitude and direction. So how am I supposed to get the direction of this resultant vector, of the cross product? And uh, that's actually going to require some other uh, techniques uh, known as the right-hand rule. Um, we'll also, there are also some more math techniques to do it, um, and we'll cover those in subsequent videos. But for now, just remember that this formula is giving you just the magnitude of the resultant vector of the cross product. And you know, already off the bat, we can already tell something about the cross product just by looking at this formula, because we'll notice that it's proportional to sine of theta. And sine of theta is equal to one whenever the angle in between them, theta, is equal to 90 degrees, or an odd multiple of 90 degrees. And it is equal to zero whenever the angle in between the two vectors is equal to zero degrees, so the two vectors are parallel. So the cross product will be zero if the two vectors are parallel, and it will be a maximum if the two vectors are perpendicular. So just like we said the dot product was a measure of how parallel two vectors are, we can say that the cross product is a measure of how perpendicular two vectors are. Just a way to think about it. And one sort of staple example and staple use of the cross product is with torque. Torque is something like a rotational force that determines how much an object can rotate. Um, physically, it's how much an object has the ability to change an object's angular momentum. Torque itself is represented by a cross product that tau, the torque, is equal to some r cross f. And so what this is saying is that you're rotating, uh, you're applying a force on some object at a distance r from its center of rotation, and you're applying a force f. So it's the cross product between r, the distance from the center of rotation, to a point where you apply a force f on. 
and I'll be explaining torque conceptually in order to explain the cross product conceptually and show you why you would ever need to use a cross product. Okay, so in order to understand the cross product conceptually through torque and rotational force, we're going to apply some forces to some objects at a distance. So here I have some sort of lid of a box. Um, you could also, if you want to do this yourself, you could use a phone and I'm going to apply forces to it. Um, so I'm applying, a f so from a distance R from the center, I'm applying a force F here on the right side. And the question is, what will happen? Well, we know that some sort of torque will be created because we know have the formulas for torque that tau is equal to R cross F, that's this cross product, and we want to see what will this cross product give us physically. So let's say I apply this force here on the right, so I'm going to do that and let's see what happens. So we saw the object rotated counterclockwise. I applied a force with my finger on the right at this point and it rotates counterclockwise. And so we might say that there's a counterclockwise torque on this object. But in fact, we can do better than that because saying that the torque is in the counterclockwise direction, well, that's not exactly like intuitive because I told you that the torque is a vector and I told you that it's gotta be perpendicular to R and F, the two vectors that cross into it because it's a cross product. And so how is a count how do you describe a counterclockwise vector? So we've got to have a better way to describe this torque other than just being counterclockwise. And in fact, we can do so by thinking, what axis is this object rotating on when it rotates counterclockwise? In other words, what axis can we skewer this object on so that it, ro so that it rotates counterclockwise? And the answer is that that's an axis that's coming um, perpendicular to the plane of the video and um, that is this axis right here. It's this axis coming out of the page. And so that is the direction of our torque. So you can see we have R cross F is equal to this torque out of the page. You can see that all three vectors are perpendicular. And, um, and we can represent the out of the page by a dot with our arrow convention. And then you might ask, well, why did I choose to make this uh, vector, this torque vector, out of the page instead of into the page? We'll just keep it as a convention for now that out of the page represents uh, counterclockwise rotation and into the page represents clockwise rotation, but that will make more sense when we discuss the right-hand rule. So in this next example, we're just going to take R and flip it and apply a force on the left side. So before R was pointing to the right, now it points to the left. And we're going to apply a force here and let's see what happens. In this case, the object rotates clockwise. Here, I can show you again. I'm applying a force with my finger at this point here on the left side, and it rotates clockwise. So maybe we could say our torque is clockwise, but again, we need a better description than just saying that a torque vector is clockwise. We need a vector that's perpendicular to these two. So we again think about skewering the object on some sort of axis for it to rotate clockwise, and that would be this, once again, it would be this perpendicular axis here. But this time, since the object rotated clockwise, we're going to flip our vector and say that the torque vector was into the page. This is just a convention by the right-hand rule, and we can get into that later. And so, our three perpendicular vectors would be as such, and it would be represented by a cross with the um, arrow convention. And so this is our torque vector, this is our R vector, and this is our F vector. And so basically we just flipped the R vector and that ended up flipping the resultant torque vector. So there are two interesting cases of the cross product we need to consider. Um, and the first one is if we apply the force to the center of the object. Let's see what kind of torque this gives us. No rotation, only move forward. So I'm applying a force to the center, and again, no rotation. Now if there's no rotation, there must be no torque. And if there's no torque, then this cross product must be equal to zero. Why? Well, the answer is pretty simple. Here, R is equal to zero because I'm applying a force directly to the center. 
So the vector from the point at the center to the point where um, I apply the force is exactly zero because I apply a force exactly to the center. So there's no torque because this r is equal to zero. Well, I guess that's pretty simple. You could tell me if I just plugged in zero to this formula, I'd get zero torque, but it shows you that you get no rotation. It's just like you'd expect. The other case we should consider is if the force and the r vector are parallel. Will we get any rotation or torque there? Well, let's see. If I apply a force to this point right here in this direction, again, no rotation, only some translation. I'm applying a force with my finger here. It only just slides. It does not rotate. So why is that? Um, well, the reason here, again, can be seen in the formulas. So um, just recapping, we see that there's no rotation, so that means the torque must be zero, and if the torque is zero, then the cross product is somehow zero. Well, we know from this first formula that gives us the vector form of the torque that um, r is non-zero and f is non-zero, so we should expect that this torque should be non-zero. But if we look at the magnitude of the torque, we see that it's proportional to sine of theta. And in this case, what's theta? Well, if these two vectors are parallel, theta is zero degrees or 180 degrees. It's actually 180 degrees because they're um, opposite in directions. And sine of 180 degrees is zero. So the torque goes to zero because the two vectors are parallel. And that's a really key property of cross products in general. Cross products are measuring how perpendicular two vectors are, and if they're completely parallel, then the cross product is just going to go to zero, and there will be, in the example of torque, no rotation, no cross product. Alright, so a quick recap of this video and what you should take away. A cross product is a vector operation between two vectors that returns a third vector perpendicular to the first two and such that all three of them are perpendicular. A cross product needs to happen in three dimensions. You simply cannot have three vectors all perpendicular to each other in two dimensions. You need that third dimension. Applications of cross products show up when uh, rotating objects around some center of rotation. Our next job is to learn how to calculate cross products mathematically, how to calculate both their magnitude and direction mathematically, and how to calculate them conceptually and quickly with the right-hand rule. Thank you.